We are looking at legal structures today. Um, our speakers today are Chris Steenstra and Barbara McDermott, the partners in a law firm based here in Hamilton, Norris Ward McKinnon, which is a full service legal firm with specialists in pretty much all areas, not-for-profits, agri and commercial. Um, Barbara advises clients on a wide variety of matters um, and is essentially their go-to person for agribusiness matters. Um, and Chris is a specialist contracts lawyer and works alongside clients to help set up um, their required structures. So they're going to be taking us through the potential legal structures you may consider for your catchment group um, and some of the pros and cons and key considerations um, and some recommendations when you're going about um, selecting the structure. And I'm just going to hand across now uh, to Chris and Barbara. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, Thanks for having us and thanks everyone for, for joining the session today. So we've popped a wee bit of an agenda together. Maria, if we just want to work through the next slide. So today we're going to cover off um, the main structure options for putting together a not-for-profit group. So uh, trotting through those will be unincorporated associations or, or groups of people, um, incorporated societies, unincorporated trusts, incorporated trust boards and companies. So they're the main ones. There are a few others, but we don't see them very often. Um, the next section we'll cover is around charitable status. So what it means to become a charitable entity um, and how that fits in with the structure options um, that are available. Then we'll cover off a few other considerations, things to think about when you're choosing a structure to put in place for your group. Um, and then some recommendations. So what we would typically consider to be uh, an appropriate structure to put in place. Um, and then for those that have already set up an incorporated society and are operating under that structure, we've got a new bill that's coming into effect um, very shortly. So uh, we'll cover off a few of the key aspects um, and a bit of a to-do for you there. Um, so yeah, uh, that's what we'll cover off today. There's a few polls um, and opportunities for questions that are scattered throughout. So feel free to pop those questions in the, in the chat bar, as Maria mentioned, and we'll pick those up as we go. Um, hopefully break it up a bit. There's a little bit of content to get through. Um, I think the session's being recorded and will be available later, as will the slides. So um, you should have some reference material um, to look back on as well. So the first structure we're going to talk through is an unincorporated association. So, so we'll, first of all, we'll talk through the unincorporated association um, as an entity type. So effectively, an unincorporated association is kind of a default. If you put nothing in place and you're a group of people working together for a common purpose, you'll be known as an association or unincorporated association. There's no registration requirement. And often um, this is the sort of structure that would be in place at the very early stages of a group being formed. Um, once you get a bit of momentum, then often associations will transition to another entity type. So running through some of the key aspects here. So we thought we'd follow a similar format for each entity type. So you can, if you're doing a bit of comparison, you've, you've got a simple way of doing that. So first of all, the founding document, so usually an association will have a set of rules. So members will be will be um, will join the association. There will be some sort of committee um, set up to run the organisation. Um, and from a legal perspective, there's no statute or um, legislation that applies here. Really, all we're talking about is a relationship of contract between the members. So based on those rules, and also um, quite a long list of common law requirements that are in place about how these associations are to operate. So the committee is the governing um, outfit. They look after things. Often the rules will set out how they're elected or removed um, and things like terms um, for, for sitting in that governance seat um, and what happens with elections and all of those sorts of things. Um, of course, if there's no rules in place, then it's a very informal setup. In terms of members, um, the association is, is well supported um, for membership. Um, usually there's some sort of levy 
that people pay um, to join the association. Again, coming back to those rules um, and what's put in place. Donations are, are another common funding source. Um, usually they're tipped into whatever bank account can be opened and the association uses that money to achieve its, its purpose. Um, one of the big drawbacks from associations is that there's no separate legal entity created. So effectively an association is a group of people acting together in a kind of joint fashion um, where all of those individual people are liable for the operation of the association. So usually that's a bit scary um, for those, those members and the committee, um, which is often why um, an association, once it gets a bit of momentum, will look at other entity types um, to try and limit some of that risk. Some of the other benefits are that it's very fluid, so easy to establish and wind up. Um, basically, you just follow whatever rules have been put in place. Um, if there's insufficient membership, then um, it just kind of withers away and, and is wound up. Um, obviously, it's the default position, so if nothing else is done, then usually an association will be the entity type that applies. And often there's a level of accountability of the committee to members as well. So that all just depends on whatever rules have been put in place and what have been accepted by members. So as an overview, that's, that's kind of how an association um, fits into the picture.